Hi everybody, it's Liz. I make it 12.30, so we are going to make a start. First of all, let me say how fantastic it is to see so many of you in the webinar. I'm absolutely delighted, and I know that Jean will be too. So it's great to have you here. Um, <laughs> some of you have answered the question that's posed on the screen in front of you already, but no problem. We're going to ask you again for your answers in the, uh, uh, when we do a poll in, the moment, in a moment. Um, so let's make a start. Obviously, you're here because you want to attend the webinar on practical writing tips for engineers. Um, and it's really interesting that this being learning work week um, that you've chosen to put a, you know, to give us an hour of your time to focus on this subject. As Jean will be talking about, it's a hugely, hugely important topic uh, for all of us, for all of us, whatever our profession may be. Um, you'll see that the facilitator today, the subject matter expert, is Jean. Uh, my role is to chair the meeting, to, um, to take your questions, to answer any comments that you might have in the chat box, and indeed just to facilitate the session on Jean's behalf. Um, most of you have already done this, which is great, but just a word for those of you who may not yet have posted into the chat box, and that is when you want to post a comment, make sure that you send to all participants if you want everybody to see it, or to all panelists if you just want myself, Jean, and Rachel to see it. Try not to um, click on all attendees because some of us may not see that, may not see your message then. So it's all participants or all attendees. Uh, sorry, all participants or all panelists. I'm getting distracted already by the chat box. I'm really sorry that uh, Andrew seems not to be getting any sound. Uh, Rachel, if you could reach out to Andrew and see if we can help him with that, that would be great. I'm kind of assuming that the rest of you are are able to hear me, otherwise I will be getting a lot more messages than the one from Andrew in the chat box. So remember, that's all the user instructions really that you ne thank you for your comments in the chat box. It's very reassuring for me to know that, um, that you are hearing me. And Andrew, I'm delighted that you're back. That's great. OK, so we'll move through. I'm on the right-hand side of your screen there. Hello from me. It's Liz, Liz Bennett. And my role at IMECI is I, I head the consultant team. So I'm head of consultancy here at IMECI. And as I've said already, it's my pleasure, really, to be facilitating this session on behalf of Jean. And Jean's photograph you can see on the screen also. Let, let me just introduce Jean, uh, and I'll spare her, <laughs> to a degree I'll spare her modesty. I know she doesn't want me to say too much about her, but, but Jean is your subject matter expert on this. Jean, like myself, is an IMECI trainer, the Institutional Mechanical Engineers trainer. Um, Jean also is an engineer, so Jean understands your world. And in putting together these slides, Jean has absolutely tackled it from the position of, of what do we in engineering need to know in order to, um, to perfect our writing tips. There'll be much more from Jean on this in a moment. So Jean, as a trainer, specializes in engineering topics, uh, primarily uh, project management, technical report writing, engineering specifications, and all matters of engineering concern. Her background, as I said, is an engineer. She's an engineer through and through and a fellow of the IMECI. So in a moment, I will be passing over to Jean to actually start the session. Again, just a reminder from me, if you have any questions, and I hope you do, I hope you have lots of them, my role will be to monitor the chat box as best I can. Can I just say a word, a word to the wise, really? Um, at various points throughout the next hour, I will be taking your questions that are gathered in the chat box. I won't in interrupt Jean constantly with questions. You know, I'll, I'll do it at, at various points throughout the webinar rather than answer everything immediately. If I 
overlook one of your questions, please just repost it. It is not, you know, it's not me ignoring it. It's not me saying, oh, this is too difficult to answer. So if I do overlook anything, then please just re-ask it, because my intention is to pick up all of the questions and all of the comments if we can. Okay, so Jean, over to you. I think we'll make a start. Okay, thank you very much, Liz, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Can I, I just check uh, if one can hear me okay? If you can perhaps just uh, one or two of you drop in the chat box that you can hear me, that would be great. Um, and it's fantastic to see so many people here um, from all over the UK and internationally too. That's fantastic. And I'm recognizing quite a few of the companies I've done training for. Um, so uh, you're very welcome. And uh, right, so let's get cracking. Excellent. I can see lots of yeses. Excellent. You can all hear me. That's super. Okay, so let's start with a very brief introduction. Um, we all know that engineers have to write as, as part of their work, and, and many engineers don't enjoy this aspect of their role. They can do the rocket science bit, but the, the writing bit they sometimes find hard. So today's webinar about practical writing tips for engineers is just some bite-sized content to help you with your writing. So what we're going to cover today, we've got three main topics, purpose, punctuation, and proofreading. So aside from the alliteration, they all start with the letter P, they're all issues that you often have in your everyday work. And what I'd like to do is just share some practical tips with you. So we'll start by covering the purpose of your writing, the seven generic purposes, and writing with pride, that's P-R-I-D-E. We'll then look at punctuation, including the right way to use apostrophes and a watch point on the wrong way to use them. I've already seen one or two of the comments in the chat box about the green grocers. Um, apostrophe, um, so that's how not to use an apostrophe, and uh, a few tips on abbreviations and acronyms. And then the final section is about proofreading, which is a vital stage in the writing process, and it's often overlooked. Um, so then towards the very end of the webinar, we'll just tell you a little bit about some related IMECI training courses. We've designed this webinar to be complementary to these, so whether you've done one of the training courses or not, there should be something new for you. And as Liz says, we'll take some of your comments and the questions as we go through. And Liz will be keeping an eye on the chat box. Um, and we'll have a few minutes at the end if there's any other sort of general questions about writing, etc. OK, so um, purpose. So um, if, you, if you're, you need to be clear on the purpose of your writing, and that's key to successful communication. So before you launch into writing anything, it's worth taking a moment to be clear about your objective. What are you trying to achieve? One way to do this is to consider the seven generic types of purpose, most of which apply to um, both writing and speaking. So sometimes your objective is simply to interact. For example, when you're posting on social media, you're interacting with your friends. Or to entertain, such as writing a novel or a magazine article. Uh, being realistic, these two categories are not usually our purpose in engineering writing. Probably the most common for us as engineers is to inform, for example, communicating a message in a technical report, or to record such as recording the basis of a design or documenting it for future reference. Another one is to regulate. Um, audit reports, for example, are regulating. Uh, also procedures, because we want to regulate behavior. Sometimes what we want to do is find out, perhaps an email or a letter asking for information. And finally, we can also write to influence. This might be presenting a proposal, or recommendations, or perhaps making um, a business case. You may find that you've got more than one of these, but usually you only have one main purpose, and then a secondary one. So again, perhaps you'd like to reflect on your engineering work. 
which one of these seven is usually your primary purpose? Um, and please feel free to share that with us in the chat box. As I say, it's really important just to take this moment to reflect on why you're writing, um, because if you're not clear on what you're trying to do, chances are you won't achieve it. Okay, so there's quite a lot of inform here. Um, a few influencing, regulating, informing. I think informing seems to be the major one there. That's really interesting to see. Okay, excellent. Right, keep those coming and we'll, we'll um, pick them up as we go through. So, have you ever asked yourself, um, when you've read a report or a document, so what? What's that author trying to tell me? What am I supposed to do with this document? I certainly have, and that's an example where people haven't really got clear themselves on their purpose and communicated it. So you have to put yourself in your reader's shoes. If you as a writer are not clear on your purpose, then you're probably going to fail to communicate with your reader. And personally, I think this big so what question is really the key to effective writing, so much so that I even called and used it for the title of my book, So What? So keep this in mind, and next time you're writing, take a moment to think about your purpose before you dive in. Okay, so building on that purpose, purpose is also one of the five key points for effective writing. Um, what I have um, is the expression, take pride in your writing, which means more than the face value, is also the acronym of PRIDE, P-R-I-D-E, where the P uh, stands for purpose, as we've just discussed. So the next letter is R for reader. A vital aspect of planning any writing is to consider your reader. What are they expecting from you? Where are they coming from? Are they technical or non-technical? What's their educational background? And what prior knowledge of the subject do they have? Is this the first time they're reading about it? Or perhaps it's an update on something they're very familiar with? Are they internal or external to your organization? And if they're external, you need to be aware of any confidential information or perhaps other restrictions. Will you have more than one reader? If they're very different, considering all of these questions, what you might need to do is produce more than one document targeting your different readers. So the I stands for integrate. What you should do is integrate your writing with your engineering work. It shouldn't be a sort of bolt-on or afterthought. So when you're planning a project, build in the writing tasks and, and allow enough time to do them properly. So Decide if you're going to write up your work as you go along or at the end. For say, a larger project or academic work, your writing may well be a core part of your work. For example, you might write a literature review, which then informs the next stage of your research. Alternatively, make sure you note any references, capture relevant information, so that you're prepared for the writing phase later. So, also, bear in mind the size of your document, that should be proportionate to the size of the task. And similarly, the style and the format should suit the nature. So this is all part of integrating your work and, and your writing. Um, so for example, in style, um, we've talked about this in, in previous webinars, but a, a, a report would be more formal than an email. And a specification should have a tighter writing style than a technical report. So the D and the E are the final two um, parts of this acronym, draft and edit. So when you're writing, what you should always do is do this in two stages. This helps you produce better quality work, and it's a much, much more efficient use of your time. So the first stage of drafting is just to get down what you need to say, avoiding distractions, not worrying about finding exactly the right word or composing the perfect sentence. Then the second stage is to edit it. And then you review your draft, you revise your wording and your phrasing, you check your spelling and your grammar, etc. So what this 
approach of, of drafting and editing does, it, it echoes this purpose in the reader. Because in drafting, you're, you're writing to fulfill your purpose, what it is that you need to communicate. And then in editing, you're um, revising the content to help your reader understand it better. So if you think of A, B, and C, accuracy, brevity, and clarity, you need to make sure that what you write is accurate and communicate it briefly and clearly. So that finishes the pride, P R I D E. I'll just pause there if you've got any comments or questions um, from the chat box. Uh, hi, Jean. No, no specific comment on the purpose part of it yet, though there's some interesting comments coming through in the chat box. Yes, yeah, Simon, it's great that you love that ABC. I, I certainly agree with that. That uh, such a good acronym to use, Jean. So thank you for sharing that with people. Um, uh, Jean, Nicola is asking in the chat box if you can explain integrate again. Oh. Uh, and um, Kadijas is saying he didn't get the B in the ABC, so it's for brevity. So, Jean, could you do a quick recap of ABC yes, of and yep. a quick recap of Integrate, please? Thanks. Yeah, sure. ABC is accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Um, so that's what you do in the editing phase, and that's what your objective is to try and write um, um, accurately, briefly, and clearly. Okay, um, so the integrate, the real is, is about integrating your writing with your work. One of the biggest problems that people struggle with with writing is that they do their work or their project, and then afterwards they think, oh, I've got to write a report or something. Um, whereas it's much better to plan your writing and integrate it as part of your project. So really what I'm saying is, is plan it in. That's the key to the integrating. Plan it in and make a conscious decision whether it's appropriate to write it up as you go along. If you're doing perhaps an academic project, that would be a better way to do it. Or if you're just doing a test and then you're documenting it afterwards, then you might write up afterwards. But the key is to recognize that the writing is an integral part of your work. It's not a bolt-on afterwards. So I hope that would help. I think that certainly explains it. Um, thank you, Jean. But, but of course, if you still have questions, keep them coming in the chat box. Jean, can I just interrupt at this stage, because I think we might be going to lose Jemima, um, who's asking in the chat box that there's going to be a recording of this because she's going to get called away into a meeting any minute. We, <laughs> oh, yeah. we know that, even on a Friday. Jemima, yes, it's been recorded, so no, no worries. If you do have to leave us, we totally understand. Um, Jean, before we move on, I think there is a question related to purpose that I'd like us to tackle now, if we can, and it's from DK. You may see it in the chat box. The question is, how do you tackle brevity when we are supposed to, oh, sorry, when we are supposed to list our assumptions, stroke technical details, and that's usually long? So how can you have brevity in those situations? Any views on that? Uh, it's a very good question, yes. I mean, I think one of those things, it's a little bit how long the piece of string, because mm. it has to be appropriate. And, and often with these things, there's a, there's a balance of judgment about it, it needs to be as long as it needs to be, but no longer. Mm. Um, so th there is an element of, of judgment with that. Um, what, one of the sort of um, litmus tests I like to use, if it's something like it, assumptions or technical details in the report is um, if, if you could give that report to a peer, so someone who's got a similar level of experience in your technical field, could they repeat your work? So have you told them, you know, what test equipment you're using or, you know, what software you're using, what assumptions you've made, etc. So that for me is a litmus test. If people could actually repeat your work, then that would have given them enough. But you don't need to start explaining exactly how to do chapter and verse of a routine kind of test that someone in your department would know how to do, for example. So it's, I, I like to think it's enough that a competent peer could duplicate your work um, by finding the same um, inputs or assumptions. So I hope that helps. That's good advice, Jean. Thank you. And we'll do very quickly one more, because I'm conscious we need to get through the rest of the agenda. And we can come back to some of these purpose ones if there are more posted in the chat box later. 
Um, but let me just take one more for now, and it's from Bill. Can the ABC process be considered appropriate for writing minutes of meetings too? Hmm. Yes, absolutely, because um, it's a tip about writing generally. Um, the ABC it comes from, um, I think it's Joan Van Emden's um, report. In, in our technical writing course, we talk about clear, concise, and correct, which says a similar thing in different words. But yes, you can apply it to any writing. A minutes of meeting is a classic example because you've got to make sure that you, you're accurately recording what was said in the meeting, but briefly because you want people to read them, not file them. Um, and um, it needs to be clear about who's going to take which action or what decisions were made, etc. So yeah, absolutely, it would apply to meetings. And uh, it, it, it applies um, to a lot of different forms of writing. Okay, great. Jean, my suggestion now is that we move on, and I will continue to monitor the chat box. I'll just mute myself again and try and get some opportunity to answer more questions later. Thanks, Jean. Okay, thank you, Liz. That's great. Okay, so punctuation. So let's go back to the question I posed on the opening slide before we started. So um, hopefully if um, we can get the technology here, um, we should have a poll coming up, so hopefully Rachel is going to get this poll working for us. Um, so what we've basically got here is a simple sentence. The printer stopped. Its ink cartridges needed replacing. So um, which one of these sentences uses apostrophes correctly? So hopefully you can all see that poll now. Um, so if you can uh, select A, B, C, or D, that would be great. OK, so you've got about 45 seconds to do that in total. So while we're just waiting for you to put your inputs in, um, let's just remind ourselves why punctuation is important. Because good punctuation helps your reader understand your writing more easily. Conversely, poor punctuation gives a poor impression of you and your work. And it might mean that you fail to communicate clearly, or even worse, that perhaps you convey the wrong meaning to what you intended. OK, so um, how are we doing with the poll there, uh, Rachel? Have we got uh, an output? I think um, we just need to uh, process the results. It might just take a moment. OK, so the results are coming in. OK, so it looks like nobody said A. We've got 43% uh, that said B, 31% that said C, and 4% that said D. OK, the correct answer was B. Uh, neither of these words should have an apostrophe. So well done to those of you that got this right. Um, and for those of you that need a little refresher, we'll have a closer look at this. Um, the reason the... Um, it um, doesn't have an apostrophe is because it's a possessive pronoun, which is a special case we'll talk about in a moment. And the cartridges also doesn't have um, an apostrophe. This is an example of the screengrocer's apostrophe. Plurals should not have apostrophes. So let's have a look at this in, in more detail. So well done to all of the, those who got it right. Um, and I think the common confusion there was on the um, the possessive um, pronoun, so we'll make sure we cover that for you. So, in summary, we use apostrophes for two purposes. One is the contraction, and one is the possession. Um, and um, some people describe this the use of the apostrophe as the difference between your knowing your and you have to fill in the four-letter word here, but I think you can imagine what I'm, uh, I'm suggesting here. Okay, so knowing that you're, or knowing that you're, it, and that punctuation actually um, could make um, uh, quite a bit of a difference in your, in, <laughs> in your meaning. Okay, so before we go into um, the contraction and possession, let me just clarify that you should not use apostrophes for plurals. This is a very common mistake. So as you can see in this picture, uh, this is somewhere I visited recently, and this sign says single malts with an apostrophe. The bar has a number of whiskies, and it's plural. C 
So there should be no apostrophe before the S. Similarly, these are all real examples I've seen. Um, a shop selling CDs, it's a plural. There should not be an apostrophe. It's simply a plural. In fact, this apostrophe for plural is so common to things like apples, etc., that um, some people describe this as a greengrocer's apostrophe. Um, so if you're, if you're selling apples on a market stall, there should not be an apostrophe. Uh, another example I saw is, is legs, bums, and tums. Again, these are all plurals. Um, and actually, this apostrophe is something that people can get really quite annoyed about. I know a woman who was so annoyed by the local garage advertising MOTs with an apostrophe that she had to drive a different route to work, which was further, um, just to avoid it. Um, and interestingly, there was a, a news item recently about a grammar vigilante who called himself the apostrophizer. So he's been going around Bristol for the past 13 years, apparently, correcting signs by adding or even covering up apostrophes. So, for example, Amy's nails, that nails is a plural, so there should not be an apostrophe there. Um, interestingly, um, the, um, according to the newspaper report, he's an engineer. So maybe he's even on this webinar. So welcome, apostrophizer, if you're here. I'm sure you'll spot my deliberate mistakes. OK, so moving on to how we should use apostrophes. So the first correct use is as a, a contraction. So um, what a contraction is is where one or more letters have been omitted. So shortening the word not is a common example. So for example, has not becomes hasn't, and did not is shortened to didn't. So in these cases, uh, the space um, and the letter though uh, are omitted. Sometimes you also get a change in spelling, such as um, will not becomes won't. So other examples of contraction are wheel for we will, and there for they are. So just be careful with this last one, because again, this is one of these commonly confused words. Um, there's three words that all sound the same, there, there, and there. So there, T-H-E-I-R, is the possessive pronoun where something belongs to them, and there, which could be an adverb, as in he lived there. In fact, it could be a noun or interjection as well. OK, so we're talking here about they are, and we're contracting it by putting an apostrophe and omitting the letter A, and also the space. So while contractions are common in speech, um, I mean, that's like how I'm talking to you now, it's not considered appropriate style if you're writing formal writing. So in a formal report or other sort of formal document, um, you shouldn't really use those contractions. Um, as, a, as an exceptional case, what you can do is use an apostrophe for letters. So if you see, for example, T's and C's, you can put T apostrophe S and C apostrophe S. Um, but personally, I prefer to think of this as a contraction rather than a plural, because um, that um, breaks the previous rule we were talking about, about not plurals. OK, so then the other um, appropriate use is for possession. So what possession means is that something um, belongs to somebody, or is owned by something, or it's of something. So if we've got um, a singular noun, that is, there's only one of something. Um, what you do is you add the apostrophe followed by the letter S. So, for example, we've got Pierre's desk and the laptop's cable, apostrophe S. So there's a handful of rare exceptions to this where you would just put the apostrophe without the S. Um, the, the grammar rules basically say it seems like ancient proper names end in maybe ES or IS, so if it was Moses or Ulysses, for example, you would just put an S, an apostrophe, and not another one, because um, when you say them, um, you wouldn't say them with the extra one. You wouldn't talk about Moses' tablets, for example. It just wouldn't make sense. 
um, but the general rule is a singular noun is apostrophe s. So then if it's a plural noun um, ending in s, um, then you simply add the apostrophe because you've already got um, the s and it's already plural. So roads maintenance means the maintenance of the roads and it's plural, so therefore you're talking about more than one road. So if the noun is only plural, then this is similar to the rule about the singular nouns. So what you do is you have an apostrophe followed by an S. So for example, children's and men's. So the special case we have here is possessive pronouns, because um, these words are, are possessive by definition. So they don't need um, an apostrophe. So these are words like hers and yours and its. Okay, so they are all possessive pronouns. It means belonging to her or belonging to it, etc. But you don't have an apostrophe. This is the, um, the only example of a possessive that's got no apostrophe. And again, um, going back to our little poll, this um, possessive pronoun of it is a really common mistake that people make. So if there's an apostrophe in it, then it means it is. So a way to test if you've got the right one in your writing is if you could substitute the it with it is, then it's right to have the apostrophe. Otherwise, there should not be. OK? So um, the final sort of section on abbreviations and acronyms, I can see one or two questions, but um, I'll just cover this one slide and then we'll pause for um, any questions on um, any of these punctuation points. So um, abbreviations are something just to be careful of in, in your writing because they sort of interrupt the flow of your writing, etc. So abbreviations, they're a shortened form of a word um, or phrase, so um, a road or a doctor. So they're normally pronounced as a full word. Um, there's very few of these, but if you've got um, abbreviations, um, for example, in engineering drawings, what you should do is refer to the relevant standard or glossary that defines them. And um, you should write words in full. So, for example, write the word and, not the character and. So, um, as a general rule, um, avoid abbreviations when you're writing formal documents. Um, this also applies to Latin abbreviations such as e.g., that means exemplar, exempli, beg your pardon, gratia, which is, for example, i.e., id est, um, that is to say, and etc., uh, which means and similar things. So those Latin abbreviations are not considered formal style, but um, they're also sometimes a bit vague you know, particularly something like etc., which kind of just tails off. So um, acronyms are words that are made from the first letter um, of a series of words, and they're all usually written in capitals, for example, LOLA. Anyone familiar with LOLA? OK, that stands for Listing Operations and Listing Equipment Regulations 1998. Now, if that's a regular thing you're referring to, that's a bit of a mouthful to say and to write every time, and that's quite an accepted abbreviation. But what you should do is write um, any acronyms in full the first time that you use them, and thereafter you can just use the acronym. If you're only going to use a term maybe once or twice in your whole document, then what you should do is um, probably just write it out in full. Um, and make sure you use a glossary to explain any terms, um, you know, special terms or acronyms. So acronyms are useful in moderation because they can help you write more concisely, and particularly when it's one that's used in your field. But generally what you should do is refrain from creating new acronyms as people won't be familiar with them. Um, and I've seen quite a few of these where people just randomly almost in, invent new acronyms. Um, and that makes it doubly hard because no one's ever going to have heard of those. OK, so um, let's just pause there and um, take some of these questions and comments. I can see a few of you are uh, 
going to be here but not, not had a chance to read them as I'm going through. Uh, no, Jean, there's some, there's some fabulous questions and I actually think a number of them have, were posted before your last one or two slides. So they, they probably have been answered, but I just want to make sure they have been answered, that people are happy with it. So I'm going to go quickly through, um, and I'm going right back to John's question. How do we make sh how do we make a plural of a contraction ending with the letter S? Um, if we contract uh, the example is if we contract anti-vibration support to AVS, um, what is the best way to indicate more than one of these items? So I think what John's getting at there is can we say AVS's <laughs> AVS apostrophe S? Does that make sense? Um, can you see that yes, question, if AVS, you're saying, So AVS would be like your acronym. Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, so if it was a plural, you could just add a small s. Presumably the AVS mm -hmm. is all going to be in capitals. Yes, correct. Um, you could just put a small s. Um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I would do. Um, John, let us know in the chat box if that doesn't answer your question. I think it does. I think that's exactly what I would see as well. AVS, capital, small s at the end. Um, uh, Nicola, again, if you're not sure about plurals, I know that Rachel has helped you with that, but let us know if you need anything more. Um, I think, Jean, you might have seen there's a series of questions and comments around um, uh, uh, sometimes why apostrophe is added at the end of the word, and the example given is artists, plural, with the apostrophe afterwards, but several of um, the participants have responded to that. So. It, Again, um, Selin, if, if the answers you've already got from your colleagues here don't, don't help, let us know. Um, this is an interesting one from Selin. Could you tell me which is correct, UK Women Network or UK Women's Network? Women's in the second theme, women apostrophe S. Do you have a view on that, Jean? So UK Women's Network. So it's, it's so, yeah, when women is a plural, yeah. W-O-M-E-N, yeah. is the correct UK Women Network or UK Women's apostrophe S? Um, I think grammatically they're both correct. Mm. I think it's probably more a, a, a matter of which one you think sounds better. Um, because, you know, sometimes in titles of things they don't necessarily, um, it's not like a conversational tone. Um, all I would say is if you're talking about women's network, um, yes. then, you know, are you talking about um, the network belonging to the women, in which case it's apostrophe S. Yes. Um, yeah. To put the apostrophe in the right place. <laughs> yes, that would be rubbing salt into the wound if it was in the wrong place. Uh, interesting question here from DK. Uh, do you consider company, like the word company, um, with a capital C, I like an organization. Do you consider company singular or plural? Um, company are proposing this or company is proposing, is the example DK has given. So would you say company are, company is? Yeah, that's, that's a really good example. Um, so there are some of these what we call like collective nouns. Um, and if they're treated as a singular, they would say is. If they're treated as a plural, they would be are. So the, the general rule with these things is if they're acting as one body, so, for example, if the company made a resolution, then it's clearly adding, acting as a singular. Mm -hmm. um, but if you had a case where the company was just a myriad of different people all acting differently, then you talk about it as R. So the subtle distinction is in the um, the intent. If, there, if it's intended that, that collective noun is acting as a body, you treat it as singular. If it's understood it's, treat, it's a, a number of separate people or components, then it would be R. So I hope that helps. Mm, sure, thanks. Thanks, Jean. Again, if it doesn't, well, I'm sure it will be told in the chat box, but, but I understand totally. A uh, specific question here from Jose. Is it normal to use et cetera, ETC, of course, is it normal to use et cetera in technical report writing? And should it have a full stop afterwards? ETC okay. dot. Okay, so we'll second it first. Um, mm. I think you'll probably find that Word would correct and put a full stop after it. 
if you were to use it, but personally I'd recommend that you didn't use it in a technical report mm -hmm. because particularly with etc., it's this vagueness. And um, you know, if you said, you know, the, the, the test conditions mm -hmm. covered all the usual, etc. Yeah. It's it's just a bit sort of vague. Yeah. Um, so it's better to be more articulate in exactly what you're saying. Mm. So it's preferably not appropriate in a technical report. Yes, and Jemima, thank you for your comment on that because the, Jemima also said something very similar. Uh, Jean, I know we're, we're, we're pushing for time, but there seems to be a bit of confusion with some people on the example of Amy's nails. Could you go back to that slide and just yeah, sure. spend a minute explaining that one again? Some people have got it, some haven't. It's led to some great discussion. Yes. So this was one of the apostrophizers examples. So um, the apostrophe on Amy is correct because it's presumably Amy's salon. But if nails are plural, then there should be no apostrophe. So it should be just nails without an apostrophe. Yeah. That's Hopefully that helps. Uh, it, it certainly does me. Again, I'm going to say to everybody, if you haven't got it, please, please, please say so, because it really is it's important. Um, okay, and similarly with the, the example of AVS, though, I think I'm just going to write that into the chat box, Jean. I think rather than spend any more time on that, uh, several people have asked, where does the S go there? Um, I'm, I'm really skimming now the the next of the the next few comments in the interest of time. This is brilliant comments, Jean. When we when we look at these later you'll see exactly the sort of thoughts that you you've been provoking here. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is great. I I'm not deliberately missing anything. I think we've covered most of them. So Jean, I would suggest you move on and guys uh, all of you participants out there, guys, generally, um, in the, I mean, in the generic sense, let me know in the chat box if there's something I haven't I've missed, please. Back to you, Jean. Okay, then. Um, well, it's good to be provoking. I'll see if I can be any more, <laughs> any more provoking. <laughs> okay. So the third topic we're going to talk about is proofreading. So proofreading is that final check in your editing process. So after you've done all your other editing, but before you submit your document for approval. So it derives from like reading the printer's proof before something literally went to print. So the aim is to spot any remaining errors. So again, bear in mind that mistakes give people a poor impression of you and you know the professionalism of, of your work. Um, so that can impact on you and your profile, and it can also mean that your work or your recommendation is you know may not be accepted or perhaps you know it doesn't have that credibility. So Proofreading is really important. So what you need to do is to check your meaning is clear and that it will be understood. So um, we'll go through some tips on proofreading. So again, please feel free to use the chat box and they, let us know which of these tips um, works for you. Um, and if you've got any other proofreading tips, please do feel free to share them with us. Okay, so. So my first tip on proofreading is actually not to do it in the sense to minimize it. So, um, you know, prevention is always better than cure. It's better to not make the errors in the first place rather than having to correct them. You know, it's a question of, you know, designing them out rather than fixing them later. So um, if you do this, it, it will save you time and effort. And, and it also helps you avoid that demoralizing feeling where you know, you have your work coming back from your proofreader covered in red ink. So use the functionality in Microsoft Word or whatever um, processor you're using um, and always start with a clean functioning template. This helps minimize the risk of some of these, you know, odd changes in font and spacing, etc. And you can also set your paragraph options to avoid hyphens and widows and orphans. So you can Select your whole document and select your, your proofing language and um, check your spelling, your grammar and your style and save all of those settings as standard. Um, and then that you know, saves you a lot of trouble later on. So another aspect is about agreeing a style guide or checklist. Because when you um, ask someone to proofread for you, 
are you making it clear what you're asking them to do and against what standard? So, for example, do you just want them to correct mistakes, that, you know, actual mistakes, or would you like them to highlight areas that might be improved? So some might consider that as editing. So, I mean, myself, I've been asked to proofread things and, and had to, um, you know, clarify that. So if you're checking grammar, is that to perhaps UK or US English? Um, and in style, um, many aspects of style are a choice, and there's more than one acceptable option. But the key with writing style is to be consistent throughout a document. So, you know, preferably across also your department and your wider organization. So, for example, how do you write numbers? Um, do you write single or double quotation marks? So, these kind of grammar and style options if you agree them at the outset in a style guide or a checklist, then you can write them all in a consistent way, and you can proofread each other's work to an agreed standard. Um, in our new um, advanced technical report writing course, we cover a checklist with, um, of a formal and clear writing style, and we talk about um, over 20 of these different elements of style there. Um, what you can also do with Word is use things like track changes um, and comments. So these allow your proofreaders to give you some feedback so that you're, you're learning from recurring issues because it doesn't help you or your proofreader in, in the long run if they just make changes without reference to you because you might lose that sense of ownership. Okay, so the next step then really is to proofread yourself. Word can check a lot of things but it can't check everything. So, for example, it can't check um, homophones, which are words that sound like another word. So if I just say whole, and I'm just saying that out loud, you've not seen it written down, but I could mean whole with an H, a hole in the ground, or whole with a W, as in the complete thing. So it may be a correctly spelt word, but it's just not the right word in your context, and word may not pick it up. So um, you still always need to proofread. So when I'm proofreading, I sometimes feel it's useful to do multiple passes, to focus on one aspect at a time. So, for example, one pass to read the text, then to view the punctuation, another for figures and labels, and then a final check on the paragraph and page layout to make sure there's no sort of awkward breaks, etc. So, um, don't be afraid of leaving white space at the bottom of the page and starting a new section, etc. Um, if it's a large task, as for any big task, um, break it down into manageable chunks. For example, read one section at a time. Because if you just skim through a document, you're really not adding any value because you do need to read it carefully if you're proofreading. Um, printing a hard copy of your final draft can help. Some people find it easier to kind of just read off the page rather than um, on the screen. Um, another tip is to read it out loud. Um, Robert Gunning, who was one of the pioneers of readability statistics, he wrote 10 principles of clear writing. And one of those was write like you talk. Now, this doesn't mean that you should write in a colloquial style. And as we talked about earlier, you shouldn't use contractions in formal writing and you shouldn't use slang. But what reading out loud is useful for is testing for those big words and long-winded explanations. So if you imagine you were sat next to someone and you were trying to explain something to them, you know, would you use complicated words and long sentences? So why, if you're then writing it down, would you use completely different vocabulary and style? So um, keep it simple and straightforward. And and you know, just and um, you know, be careful if you're reading it out loud. That will help you, um, you know, be clear on that. And um, the other aspect about reading it out loud slows you down because you've got to read it more slowly and carefully, um, and you can't skim over it as quickly as you would when you were just reading. So um, th this means you're using like more of your brain functions and, and different senses. So. For example, you can hear if you're repeating words, and you know it's usually better to have some variety, etc. Um, 
So, of course, you know, if you're going to prepare, say, a script for a conference, then you shouldn't be reading that verbatim as you've published it, but you'd want to talk more naturally about the subject. So, uh, the final one I've got on my slide here is to sleep on it. So, when you're happy with your document, save it and close it. And if your time scales permit, which ideally you'd be allowed for in your plan, if you've integrated it with your work, um, come back to it fresh the next day or preferably later. So, you know, I describe this as sleeping on it. I don't mean literally putting your, putting your document under your pillow, but, you know, giving yourself an opportunity to come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes. And I like to do this, and I often find more mistakes and, and see areas where I could improve the, the wording, you know, make it clearer. Okay, so um, my last slide on the main sort of content here. So on um, proofreading, um, you should always ask somebody else. So when you've proofread it yourself, ask somebody else. Um, some people have said to me that, well, their organization wouldn't allow them the time to proofread their colleagues' work. But actually, it's much more efficient to do that because you can read something you wrote 10 times and still not see a mistake, and someone else might spot it the first time they read it. So having somebody else proofread it is actually a much better use of time overall for an organization. Um, so remember, the role of a proofreader is very different to that of a reviewer or approver. So a proofreader is not approving your work, is not agreeing with your recommendations. So typically, uh, a proofreader is a colleague, so perhaps um, a peer who's got similar skills and experience, and they should highlight things that are obviously wrong or where something's not clear. Um, clarify the scope. So what do you want them to check? Have you agreed a consistent approach to grammar and style? Uh, if you're writing in a language that's not your native tongue, a proofreader can help you. Um, the English language in particular has got lots of irregularities, and a native speaker can really help you, you know, to identify some of those odd issues. Even like professional proofreaders might not spot everything. Um, if your document is really important, um, you know, perhaps external publication or something, um, consider having more than one proofreader. Um, some people ask their mum or their partner uh, to proofread their work. Someone who's like completely outside their technical field, um, they might spot things um, that are different. So perhaps an unexplained acronym that colleagues have just taken for granted, or perhaps note there's no introduction to the subject. So some people say this works for them, and others um, don't. But um, of course, be careful of confidentiality as well. Um, I read about a proofreading tip that was to read the whole document back, backwards one sentence at a time, which makes you read every sentence carefully. Um, I haven't tried that one myself yet. That's maybe one for me to learn. OK, so um, what I suggest we do is I'll just mention the training courses, and then we'll take any questions on that section and any final questions. Um, so I hope that's OK with you, Liz. Of course, of course, then go ahead. So just very briefly, um, if you're interested in um, learning more about this subject, the Anarchy would be very happy to help you. Um, the Anarchy have a, a full range of training courses, and um, things like um, writing that come under what we call engineering essentials. Um, there is a brochure which is available both in hard copy and on the Anarchy website. Um, what we have is um, our very popular one-day technical report writing course, um, which um, is probably the most uh, popular one where people are just come into technical report writing or, or writing for a range of technical documents. Um, engineering specifications is focusing um, more on specifications. There's some aspects of the use of English and writing, but it's also to do with um, project management and um, requirements engineering, so it's a bit more of a cross-cutting theme with that one. What we've also got new this year um, is sort of based on feedback from um, the, the courses and we've had from delegates, etc. is uh, a new advanced technical report writing course. So this is another one day um, where the technical report writing is a prerequisite. Um, but we do more 
on um, writing style, uh, charts, and use of English, etc. If your the role is more about reviewing than writing, um, there's also the reviewing engineering documents, and that includes things like um, giving feedback. And last but not least, there's a virtual option for the technical report writing, and we've got some new dates for October this year. So it's um, essentially the same content, but delivered um, in, the, in a virtual way. So um, if you're interested in anything further, there are some dates uh, that's coming up. So I'll hand over to you now, Liz, if you want to comment on these training and pick up any final questions. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Jean. Uh, we'll just leave that slide up so that people can make a note of the dates. Uh, again, really interesting comments in the chat box. People have been asking questions and other people have been uh, answering them. So that's marvellous. There's just Great, a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. There's just a couple that I'd like you to comment on, Jean. Uh, and one is, um, at the way back now, it was a few minutes ago from Elliot, when should you use which or that? For example, is it correct to say the slides which were used in the meeting are the slides that were used in the meeting? That's the theme that's going yeah. through. And the other one is, can you comment on when to use a or an? And the thing that's tricking most people is, for example, would it be a horse, my kingdom for a horse, or an horse? So those two are the threads, please, Jean. OK. OK, so um, let me start with the which and the that. So basically, they do the same thing as they introduce um, a clause. And the difference is whether it's um, a defining clause. So um, if you um, if, the, if the, the content of that clause is essential to the meaning of the sentence, then you use the word that, and you don't use a comma. And if it's just some extra information, then you would use the word which, when, and that would take a comma. So, uh, for example, if you said um, the meeting which was held in the boardroom took no action, Okay, that little bit of information which was held in the boardroom, you could actually just delete from your sentence and it would still make sense. But if you said the meeting that was held to discuss redundancies took no action, then that's that because it's a defining clause and that content is essential to the meaning of the sentence. And that does not take a comma in, in the sentence. So hopefully that gets that one. Um, and the other one, at and an. So the general rule is Use a if your noun starts with a consonant, and use an if it starts with a vowel. Um, there are one or two exceptions where there is um, perhaps a silent H or something that follows, and then you might want to use an an. But as a general rule, a is a consonant and an an for the vowel for the noun. OK, hopefully that uh, answers all of those. Yeah, thank you, Jane. In fact, in fact, I've learned something there. I never really understood the, the difference with that and which, so, so I feel very informed also. Thank you. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just bring everybody's attention to the slide. Um, the dates there, Jean has already mentioned technical report writing, advanced technical report writing, etc. so I won't repeat. You've got the dates in front of you. Let me just explain the last one, virtual technical report writing. You'll see that in, <coughs> on three dates, they are actually three sessions. Obviously, it's virtual for those people who can't, just cannot get out of the office. So it would be three, and I think they're two-hour sessions. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that, but it's three separate sessions all part of the same program. It's not three different programs. I just wanted to clarify that. And uh, yeah, Nikki, there is a charge for, for, for the courses that you're seeing on the slide in front of you. And all of those can be found in the brochure that Jean has already referred to. So, um, and let me just flag, if I may, please, in the last minute, our next webinar, as you can see, is on managing risk, and it's on the 21st of July, exactly the same time. It would be great to see you all there for that, too. Uh, and thank you so much for your participation today. Jean, you might be looking at the chat box um, right now. If there's any other comment or question that we haven't been able to answer, Jean and I can spare another two or three minutes. I'm sure. But if not, guys, we're bang on time. It's 13.30. Thank you so much for your interactivity. And of course, my last word of thanks to Jean, 
you have been fantastic, really well explained, and people have got a lot out of it. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye for now. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate it. all of those thanks. That's uh, great, and it's good to see people being so um, interactive with the chat box and everything, so uh, that's, uh, that's been really good to see. So thanks for all your contributions, and it's great when some people are answering questions for others as well. That's, uh, that's even better. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, result. <laughs> A round of virtual applause from Peter <laughs> and all of the others. That's great. <laughs> okay, uh, Jean, I don't think there's any other questions coming through, so I'm going to mute myself, but I'll stay here just in case there are. Thanks, okay, Jean. well, thanks very much to you, Liz, as well. Appreciate uh, your facilitation there. Thanks. Okay, and to Rachel for getting all the poll and everything. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, Jean, we've got DK. Is it too late to quickly recap the difference between when you would use that and when you would use which? Do you mind doing that, Jean? Sorry, Liz, was it that and which again? Yes, it is, yeah, from DK. It's just if you could re-clarify that. And yeah, which. yeah, just to recap, no problem. Yeah, so the key is about whether it's a defining clause. So the bit of information that you're introducing is that essential to the meaning of your sentence? So if you're saying, um, uh, the example I had was, you know, the meeting that was held to, to discuss redundancies took no action. That's essential to the meaning, because what the whole sentence is about is a meeting about redundancies. So you would use the word that because it's defining, it's essential to the meaning of the sentence. Whereas if you said the meeting which was held in the boardroom, decided to take no action, then that's a bit of extra information. But if you took that whole bit out, um, it, it wouldn't lose the meaning of the sentence, you know, that you're trying to convey the main meaning. So um, in that case, you would use the which. And when you're using which, you should precede it with a comma, whereas with that, there is no comma. So hopefully um, that would help. Yes, Jean, I think so. And uh, and thank you to Isamar for actually writing an example in the chat box there that, um, yes, that supports excellent. what you have just said. Uh, yes, yes that excellent. Great. Yes. yes, thank you, Atit. Yes. So, yes. Yes, perfect examples. Yes. Okay, so we've got something else from Alexander. I'm going to have to make this the last question, I think, in, in, to respect Jean's time. Alexander, in the proofreading section, you mentioned several things that you look for when you read through each paragraph multiple yeah. times. Could you please list the different individual issues you are looking for with each pass? Yeah, I mean, say you can say it to suit, but the ones I suggested was just try and read the text, as in the, just the words. Um, then perhaps look at the punctuation. Then look at your figures and labels. You know, have you labelled them all and have you called them up in the text, etc.? And are they in the right order? Um, and then do a final check on the sort of the page layout and the paragraphs, etc. Um, you know, just to make sure that you've not got any um, awkward breaks or uh, change in format, etc. So those are the four suggest. Read the text. Check the punctuation check for figures and labels, and check for the layout. But, I mean, you can, you can do different versions yourself, but the thing is to try and do it step by step, because if you, you can get sidetracked by the punctuation before you've really read the content, etc. So if you try and focus on one thing at a time, it helps. Okay, thank you, Jean. And, Jean, I said it was the last, but can I just ask one tiny specific, that's from Matthew, and it's the second time he's asked this, actually. Um, Matthew is saying, is it uh, NDT, non-destructive testing, in capitals, is, that's the, the acronym NDT, is it a NDT or an NDT? Yeah, um, I think personally, I'm not sure the precise grammar rule, but I would have to say what I personally would like would be an, because I think it's to do with how it's actually pronounced. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say if it was a, an NDT test, mm -hmm. um, then it would be an NDT test rather than a NDT test. And again, um, you've just supported what Andrea has said in the yeah. chat box there. So, Matthew, hope that helps. And, and yeah, that sounds right, doesn't it? 
So, yeah. Jean, I am going to thank you yet again, particularly for giving us more than another five minutes of your time. Um, but we're going to reluctantly end it here. Otherwise, I think I could be talking to you all afternoon, and I think the guys will probably stay around. <laughs> OK, well, thanks very much, Liz, and thank you to everybody uh, um, for your participation. That's been great. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks, Jean. See thanks. you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And bye-bye, everyone else, too. Have a lovely afternoon and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.